Hello, in this video we're going to talk about chronic kidney failure. It can also be referred to as chronic kidney disease, but failure, I guess, is the end stage. And chronic kidney failure is essentially where you have loss, an irreversible loss of the nephrons, and the nephrons are the functional units of your kidneys. And this can result in a state, a toxic state, uh, such as uremia. And we'll learn about that in this video. So here, uh, before we go into chronic kidney failure, let's just recap the anatomy slightly. So here I'm drawing the kidneys. The kidneys connect to the ureter, to the bladder. Bladder stores urine, ready for um, micturition. And here we have the inferior vena cava in the descending aorta, which has vessels coming in and out from the kidneys. Okay, so there are many causes of chronic kidney failure. And these include acute kidney injury or acute kidney failure, hypertension, diabetes, and other kidney diseases. Other kidney diseases includes polycystic kidney disease. So all of this can lead to an irreversible loss of nephron, which is chronic kidney failure or disease. So let us look at each of these causes of chronic kidney failure in a bit more detail. Let's begin by looking at acute uh, kidney failure or acute renal failure. It's the same thing. So acute kidney failure can lead to you know, chronic kidney failure. Acute kidney failure, um, unlike chronic kidney failure, is reversible. And there are many causes of acute renal failure in itself. One way to categorize it is into um, pre-renal causes, intra-renal causes, and post-renal causes. So, a uh, pre-renal cause includes renal artery stenosis, heart failure, and hemorrhage, all which leads to acute kidney failure. And then you have intrarenal causes such as glomerulonephritis, tubular necrosis, and interstitial nephritis. All this can also lead to acute kidney failure. Then you have post-renal causes such as benign prostatic hyperplasia, renal stones, and tumors. It is also important to note that pre-renal causes and post-renal causes often lead to intra-renal um, causes, essentially. And this will all lead to acute kidney failure, acute renal failure. So that was, you know, acute uh, renal failure and some causes. Again, acute renal failure can lead to chronic kidney failure. Next, let us talk about hypertension and how this can cause chronic kidney failure. In order to do so, let us draw this kidney here, which has a renal artery and a renal vein leaving the kidney. The, func the functional unit of the kidney, which actually filters you know, our blood to form urine, are the nephrons. And here I am drawing one nephron. The head of the nephron is the Bowman's capsule, and it has capillaries entering and exiting. This is where blood you know, is getting filtered through to the nephron. Now, when there's normal blood pressure, everything is smooth and everything is filtered. So let us see what happens in hypertension. Let us zoom into this area here, the head of the nephron. And, um, you know, this is the Bowman's capsule area. So blood vessels will enter this area. These blood vessels originate, you know, from the renal artery. So here I am drawing part of the renal artery which enters the kidney. When someone has hypertension, it causes thickening of the blood vessels which leads to narrowing of the lumen. Because we have narrowing of the lumen, there is less blood flow to the kidneys, to the nephrons. The afferent arterial is a blood vessel which brings blood towards the head of the nephron. But with less blood flowing through due to hypertension, there is a decrease in filtration, thus a decrease in the glomerular filtration rate. So the point is, when you have a decrease in blood flow to the nephron, there are cells in this area that detect this and then start producing renin, which subsequently leads to the activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system or RAS for short. Now, the RAS uh, system is a system which leads to increase in heart rate and further hypertension. 
This is unfortunate because less blood is flowing to the kidneys. The kidney thinks by increasing blood pressure, it will receive more blood. It might work for some time, but eventually the cycle will continue. There is further vessel thickening and vessel narrowing. So it's a vicious cycle. Now this all eventually will lead to glomerulosclerosis, which is thickening and hardening of the vessels in the Bowman's capsule, um, in the glomerulus itself. Glomerulosclerosis inevitably leads to ischemic injury and so loss of the nephron itself. Next, let us look at the most common cause of chronic kidney failure, which is diabetes. A massive complication in diabetes is diabetic nephropathy. Now, diabetic nephropathy eventually will lead to chronic kidney failure. To learn about diabetic nephropathy, let us cut a section of the Bowman's capsule and the glomerulus and see what changes occur. The four main changes we see in diabetic nephropathy are mesangial expansion and proliferation. We see podocytopathy, which includes podocyte hypertrophy and eventually atrophy. We see glomerular basement, glomerular basement membrane thickening and sclerosis. Um, and sclerosis is essentially what we see in hypertension as well. So how do all these changes occur? Well, people develop diabetes because of risk factors, which include hypertension. Diabetes is a condition where you have high blood glucose. High blood glucose leads to overproduction of um, reactive oxygen species. Now, these reactive oxygen species, or ROS, leads to a cascade of events. But in summary, um, this will lead to activation and production of unnecessary growth factors, pro-inflammatory cytokines, and, ox and producing, essentially, oxidative stress. All this leads to the four diabetic uh, nephropathy changes we just, uh, we just talked about. So going back to where we initially started, uh, chronic kidney failure, again, is where you have irreversible loss of nephrons. And this can be uh, caused, as we have learned, um, by acute uh, renal failure or acute kidney failure, hypertension, diabetes, and other kidney diseases, such as polycystic kidney disease. So when you have loss of nephrons in, an, in the area, the blood, the blood flow will shift to nephrons that are still alive and working. This leads to glomerular hyper, hyper filtration. So let me draw it out. For example, here is a, you know, here's a dead nephron, essentially loss of nephron, and here is a functional nephron. The blood flow will shift to the functional nephron, leading to glomerular hyperfiltration. There'll be more blood flow. Now, during the early stages, glomerular hyperfiltration is tolerated. We get a, a big increase in GFR in the functional nephron. After a while, this hyperfiltration results in sclerosis because there's so much pressure. And eventually, sclerosis, glomerular sclerosis, will eventually lead to loss of that nephron as well. And the cycle will continue. In the late stage, you lose so much of your uh, kidney's function that you, you that your GFR decreases, your urine output decreases, and you begin to retain waste, resulting in uremia. All this leads to the clinical manifestations of chronic kidney failure. And this will bring us to the next topic, which is the clinical presentation or clinical manifestation of chronic kidney failure. So here, in this part, we'll talk about um, disruption that occurs uh, with sodium and water balance, disruption that occurs with potassium balance. We talk about metabolic acidosis, mineral balance and osteodystrophy and other manifestations of uremia. So let's begin by looking at sodium and water balance. A decrease in GFR leads to increase in sodium and water retention, 
which leads to an increase in blood pressure and peripheral edema. It is important to restrict fluid intake for, for, for these patients. And when vomiting and diarrhea occurs uh, in patients with chronic kidney failure, this is very dangerous because of the already restricted fluid intake, further loss from vomiting and diarrhea can be very, very uh, dangerous. Next, potassium balance. So again, a decrease in GFR leads to an increase in potassium retention. This causes hyperkalemia, which can result in muscle weakness, it can result in ECG changes, and cause fibrillations. It is important to note that the loss of nephrons leads to a decrease in renin production as well, eventually, which leads to a decrease in aldosterone. When you have a decrease in aldosterone, the distal sodium potassium pump does not work, um, which leads to potassium retention. Therefore, using potassium sparing diuretics and ACE inhibitors can further aggravate the problem because you are essentially you're promoting more potassium. And remember, if I draw it in this uh, nephron, the sodium potassium pump, the sodium potassium ATPase is at the distal part of the nephron and is responsible for the exchange between sodium and potassium. So if aldosterone is not being produced, this uh, transporter does not work and so we are retaining potassium. Metabolic acidosis. Now, metabolic acidosis, we get diminished capacity you know, in chronic kidney failure to excrete hydrogen and to generate bicarbonate, which leads to the acidosis. Acidosis can lead to bone decalcification amongst many other things. So normally, the nephron is responsible for maintaining the pH of our body, the blood. By, it does this by producing bicarbonate if necessary um, or to secrete hydrogen ions if necessary. Next, let's talk about mineral and osteodystrophy. Now, when you have loss of nephrons, the kidneys cannot produce the hormone it normally produces, which is uh, calcitriol. Now, with no calcitriol, you have a decrease in calcium reabsorption from the GIT and the kidneys. And this will lead to hypocalcemia. Hypocalcemia and a decrease in calcitriol will stimulate the parathyroid glands always, continuously, and this will lead to secondary hyperparathyroidism. The hyperparathyroidism state leads to osteodystrophy because of the hormone, uh, pa parathyroid hormone, which actually stimulates bone breakdown and, um, yeah, bone breakdown essentially. The loss of nephrons eventually also lead to a decrease in GFR. And so, you know, when you have a decrease in GFR, you have a decrease in filtration. And so this will lead to hyperphosphatemia because the body cannot secrete phosphate. Um, yeah. Now let's talk about uremia, which is essentially a lot of urea in the blood. Urea is normally excreted by the kidneys in urine. Let's see what normally happens to urea. So the vasa recta are the blood vessels responsible for secretion of substances, substances into the nephron and the reabsorption of substances from the nephron. In the last part of the nephron, the urea is actually reabsorbed into the vasa recta, which helps drag water into these vessels. Urea then gets secreted back into the nephron because we don't want to keep it. And the water just remains. Water remains in the vessels because here the sodium is also reabsorbed, allowing for um, you know, equilibrium. And so if this whole process does not work, if the kidneys don't work at all, you actually retain urea and so you, you get uremia. And uremia is bad because it results in neurological signs and symptoms such as hiccups, cramps, gastro problems, anorexia and vomiting, reproductive changes including decrease in estrogen and testosterone resulting in amenorrhea and impotence. And this uremia also results in some skin changes. 
And um, so that was most of the clinical manifestations in chronic kidney failure. Finally, as we have mentioned briefly, in late chronic kidney failure or chronic kidney disease, when a lot of nephrons are lost, this will eventually result in a decrease in renin production, resulting in a decrease in blood pressure, a decrease in erythropoietin, which results in anemia, and also, as I mentioned earlier, a decrease in the production of the hormone calcitriol, which causes renal osteodystrophy, um, as I mentioned earlier. So I hope you enjoyed this video. We essentially talked about chronic kidney failure, some of the causes and some of the clinical manifestations um, that results. Thank you for watching.